Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us on today's panel discussion webinar, a deep dive into third-party risk management and NIST framework integration, brought to you by the ITGRC Forum. I'm Kelly Vick, the host of the program, and it's my pleasure to welcome today's speakers. Our moderator is Colin Whitaker. Colin is the founder and director of Informed Risk Decisions. He has over 30 years experience in cybersecurity, and he currently provides cybersecurity risk consultancy services to a wide range of public and private companies. Colin has presented on information security at major events around the world and has published a number of papers on security. And on the panel, welcome Steve Tobias, Lead Client Success Advisor at Risk Recon. Vince Dowers, Senior Implementation Services Manager at LogicGate. Joe Tully, Project Director, R&D Development at Prevalent. And Paul Asadorian, Principal Security Evangelist at Eclipsium. We'll get introductions in a moment, but first, a short housekeeping video. We'll be right back after this. The ITGRC Forum, educational content for governance, risk management, and compliance professionals. A forum for thought leaders to address today's GRC and IT security topics. Taking that threat intelligence and using that as an overlay in your existing systems becomes really important. There is a big difference in service providers versus other third parties that you might be providing data to. It highlights organizations' lack of preparedness for situations like this. Here are some housekeeping notes to be aware of. This webcast is interactive and we want your questions. Please submit these at any time using the questions tab and we'll address as many of these as possible during the webinar. We've also lined up some polls to get your input and we'll notify you when these are active. Please be ready to submit your response when prompted by using the box below your console. Just make sure the slides are not in full screen mode or you will not see the options. Make sure you check out our supporting resources in the Attachments tab, as we've uploaded some great content for you today. This webinar is approved by NASBA. To qualify for CPE credit, you must demonstrate participation by attending the full session, responding to the polls, and by rating us at the end. Certificates will be issued within seven days from our learning management system, the ITCPE Academy. So please watch out for the email notification and check your spam folder if that doesn't come through. After the live presentation, this webcast will be available on demand. So please share with any colleagues who you think will be interested in the topic. And now let's get started. Okay. So today's program will discuss how and why security gaps arise in IT security posture and address how to prioritize and assess third parties using a cyber supply chain risk assessment process. Develop processes for continuously monitoring third party security postures and determining control effectiveness. Identify security gaps and conduct response action plans with suppliers and third party providers and track the progress of implementing the NIST framework through a four tier maturity scale. Moving on to the agenda, we'll begin with speaker introductions before running over some quick tips recommended by our panel, and then we'll dive into the Q&A discussion facilitated by Colin before closing with takeaways and further information at the end. So now, without further ado, over to you, Colin. Thank you very much, Steve Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as usual, we're going to start by running around our virtual table here uh, and hear from each of our panelists. Um, it's important that they tell us a little about themselves and a little about their organizations, because that'll help everyone get a better understanding of how they relate to this afternoon's conversation and what they can contribute to the discussion. Um, Paul, I'm going to start with yourself. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, can I ask everyone to tell us about yourself and the work you're doing there at Eclipsium? Sure. Thanks, Colin. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Asadorian. Uh, currently, I work for Eclipsium as the uh, principal security evangelist. Uh, one of the things I've done for the past 18 years is a security podcast. Um, I still do that today. Uh, one is called Paul Security Weekly. Uh, the other is a new show that we're producing for Eclipsium, uh, where I interview a lot of people in supply chain and firmware security called Below the Surface. Uh, I've got a lot of background. I've always had this affinity towards uh, firmware uh, and uh, hacking, penetration testing, and things like that. Uh, I've also been an advisor to uh, select startups uh, in our industry as well. 
And the uh, unwritten, unspoken contract is I'm obligated to tell you that I'm a Linux desktop user. Uh, Eclipsium, I think, is best uh, described as a story. When I first started uh, about a year ago, I had a laptop that I thought was really secure. I've been in security for over 20 years. I updated all the software. I ran Eclipsium software on it and a bunch of other open source utilities as well. And lo and behold, found I had a lot of vulnerabilities on it. And that really resonated with me and the capabilities that we have at Eclipsium to look below the surface, if you will, at all of the different components within your PCs, laptops, servers, uh, appliances, and look at the hardware, the firmware, and the lower level software on those devices. Uh, look for vulnerabilities, look for misconfigurations, look for integrity issues so that you can ultimately have a higher degree of trust in the systems that are within uh, your environment. Uh, and then through continuous monitoring, be able to regularly reassess the state of that system and whether or not you trust it. And for a subset of these devices, even automatically apply patches. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Lee Paul. I think that's going to be quite valuable this afternoon because I don't think sometimes we focus enough on hardware issues. So I think it's going to be a, a useful contribution to discussion this afternoon. So thank you for that. So let's move on to yourself, Joe. Uh, tell us about yourself and the work you're doing there at Prevalent, Joe. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm the project director at Prevalent. I've been at Prevalent for, I think, five or six years now, um, originally from a more consultancy um, role where we were sort of standing up third party programs um, using the prevalent platform, which is a platform that uh, encompasses the whole sort of life cycle of a vendor. So onboarding, contract management, uh, risk assessments, all the way through to remediation and uh, more sort of automation of, um, uh, of event detection and things like that. Um, and my sort of strengths there were working with clients to understand how their programs fit together and I'm a firm believer of making these processes as efficient as possible, especially when we're managing suppliers and all of our inefficiencies get multiplied by each of our assessment processes that we carry out. Um, so using that experience, I work with the development team now to steer some of the, the technology to support some of the inefficiencies using automation um, to really make these programs as efficient as possible. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. I think that's going to be important in the context of uh, what we're talking about this afternoon. So thank you very much, Steve, for that. Uh, and there's the slide on what uh, Prevalent are doing. Would you like to say a few more words about what Prevalent do as a company? Yeah, sure. So it all focuses around our Prevalent platform, which is um, <clears throat> our sort of um, housing of our sort of vendor estates that we help manage for clients. So they would be onboarding their vendors within there, and we would be able to manage uh, the whole life cycle of that vendor within the system. Our main sort of focus is around um, risk assessment and ongoing management and sort of passive monitoring um, to really demonstrate that using the platform and using the capabilities of remediation that, that, are, that are found within the system, we can demonstrate we're actually improving um, risk posture and reducing risk across the business. Thanks very much indeed, Joe. Okay, let's move on to yourself, uh, Vince. Welcome. Um, tell us about yourself and Logic Gate, sir. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Vince Stewart. I'm a senior implementation services manager at Logigate. We're a, our risk cloud platform is focused on the GRC space. It's a no-code app building platform where you know we focus on third-party risk management, ERM, controls, compliance, and interconnect to those applications to really give that powerful data between those two sides. So I've been with Logigate for over two years, work heavily with our enterprise space. So a lot of good feedback on how you know some of the industry's best are handling these solutions. Um, prior to Logigate, I was a consultant at Pertivity and RSM doing a lot of risk and compliance, regulatory compliance, anti-money laundering, third-party risk. And so a lot of experience in the space and now work and help customers, you know, stand up solutions and handle that digital transformation. Um, on the Logigate side, you know, we work with a lot of the biggest players in the industry. Um, our risk cloud platform, again, makes it incredibly easy to stand up applications without a technical resource. Mm -hmm. It's all no code. So really anybody from the GRC team is able to handle these and build out their processes, um, work with myself or, you know, going on your own. So definitely an exciting way to help solve this. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And very relevant to this afternoon's discussion as well. So finally, you have Steve, but definitely not least, um, tell us about yourself and Risk Recon, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Colin. Yeah. So my name is uh, Steve Tobias. I'm a lead client success advisor at Risk Recon. 
Uh, we're a MasterCard company, by the way. Uh, and um, my, uh, my background is uh, initially in actually security engineering on the technical side and cyber risk. Uh, over 20 years experience, I came out of the healthcare sector originally um, and then uh, decided to switch lanes and, and uh, now client success at, at Risk Recon and, and really have a passion for security. And, and I think over the last few years or so, I've really kind of gravitated to third party risk and, and just understanding that and being able to um, help clients understand their third party risk. Um, from, a, from a product perspective, our platform is really designed to understand an organization's digital footprint. What does their, from an attacker's perspective, you could think of it that way, what does it look like from an attacker's view? And so we provide security ratings uh, for, for vendors and suppliers, as well as uh, your own company. And uh, you can get detailed assessments and we do additional things like continuous monitoring and alerting as well. Fantastic, R really good. And I think everyone in the audience will appreciate. Um, as usual, we put together a brilliant crop of uh, panelists to talk about third party risk. But one of the things we like to start off the discussion with is for, to really to get our juices flowing on this topic, is to get our um, panelists to come up with what they think are, is their quick tips for the uh, conversation at hand. And the first one, um, we've got tips related to understanding hardware assets, uh, understanding how we integrate uh, continuous cyber signals monitoring with our assessment results, focusing what's more important to the organization, and also leveraging security ratings aligned to cyber risk supply management. And I'm going to bring each of the panelists in a little bit uh, one at a time to tell us about their um, selected tip, including the first one up is yourself, Paul. Um, as I said earlier on, I, I think considering hardware assets and understanding what security issues relate to them is very important. I think it's something that we've all sort of let slip by. But give us your take on why that's important from a supply chain perspective. Sure. Uh, the supply chain for hardware, firmware and software, uh, the line is very much blur there. I like to say that firmware is just software that's inconvenient to program, uh, which also, also leads to a lot of vulnerabilities, but also a really messy supply chain. You know, inside your PC servers and laptops, there are several components. Those components uh, need to run firmware and that firmware or software may come from one vendor. The hardware may come from another vendor. And by the time you get that final product, whether it's in your data center, whether uh, it's a, a PC or a laptop, there is this complex mesh of different um, kind of cooks in the kitchen, if you will, that have put that together, making it very difficult to understand um, what's inside of your assets and also really difficult to know if you should trust those assets or not as these fundamental components lie well beneath the operating system. Um, and if attackers are going after this particular uh, attack surface, they can control everything independent of a lot of your other security controls. Um, so at Eclipsium, we like to focus on and, and guide people on not just understanding what's on your system, but understanding whether or not you can trust it and verifying the integrity of that software. How do we do that? So if your uh, component is saying it's running this particular firmware, we have over 180,000 plus different firmware images and we do a comparison and we tell you, hey, that is not the firmware that you think you're running. Um, we also do vulnerability analysis uh, of your firmware uh, in addition to looking for very specific threats that perhaps may allow an attacker to bypass the secure boot process uh, on your systems, which is verifying cryptographically all of the software that is involved uh, in loading your system from the time you push the power button to the time you get to the login screen. Uh, and I think I think what you're really saying here is one of the issues about this is going to become ever more important as we get more and more IoT devices embedded within the infrastructure of our companies, isn't it? Yeah, I think uh, IoT devices have certainly historically had this problem in addition to yeah. other appliances, such as firewalls, VPNs, uh, which yeah. we support as well. They run firmware and very specialized software. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed for that, Paul. That's really useful. Uh, and I think, as I said earlier, a timely reminder to everyone about how important that issue is. Uh, the next um, uh, topic is all about continuous cybersecurity monitoring. Um, Joe, I I'm curious what you mean by continuous cyber signals monitoring. Can you give us some indications of what you mean by that? 
Yes, this is um, really emphasizing my point a second ago around efficiency. Um, so an assessment approach of a third party can typically take um, a while sometimes where we have uh, you know extensive questionnaires, um, reaching out to suppliers perhaps we haven't kept in touch with us as we should have. So leveraging automated or continuous event monitoring helps make that process a lot more efficient. We can already establish a bit of the vendor profile before we actually engage with them. And there's a lot of information out there, um, some of which being financial ratings, for example, um, presence on the dark web or um, known security incidents or data breaches, ESG scores, for example. All of these things can contribute towards a vendor profile, even without you know, engaging with them to give us an idea of you know, what they're like as an organization um, and the level of controls they might have in place as well. So although a vendor might come to us and say, yes, we have all these control requirements in place and everything looks great on paper when they fill out one of our questionnaires, I feel it's important to validate those types of uh, responses with this type of uh, event monitoring so that we can actually validate what we're seeing. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I'm sure that's another issue we're going to uh, go into later on because it, it links very closely to the NSF, um, the CSF frameworks uh, from the NIST documentation. So I think we'll certainly come back to that as we're going on. So thank you for that, Joe. Uh, Vince, uh, your, your, your tip is very important. Um, it's relatively simple as well. Um, but why is it so difficult to focus on what really matters to your organization when it comes to when it comes to the third party risk management space? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, really the struggle is we want to do everything right. We want to be fully secure. We want to touch all these spaces, but identifying, you know, is it third party risk management, which framework is going to matter the most for us to begin these assessments and starting to kind of a, take that crawl, walk, run approach to building out your program and saying, all right, we've got a grasp on our third parties. Let's see how that layers into other frameworks. Let's see how we, you know, assess against each of those. And so we really recommend starting with what matters and then identifying what that roadmap looks like for that, um, you know, repeatable and manageable expansion into maturing that program. So, you know, some people want to go right into <laughs> maturity four, but if you're in maturity one, that's going to be a big jump. And so really mapping that out and saying, where, how can we get from here to here? What steps can we take? And, you know, where is the bandwidth going to exist to do that? We've seen a lot of success with. Okay, it's brilliant. Uh, I mean, I, from my perspective, actually, you know, whole issue of risk man how you apply risk management into this space of um, third party risk management is one of the important considerations. And the more mature you get at it, the more more you'll grow up the maturity scale, won't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we went through a case study of all our third party risk management customers that started with this and said, all right, where do you go from here? Where do we see your program expanding? And kind of charted out a customer journey for that. So yeah, um, we've seen a lot of success there. Thanks very much, Lee, for that, um, Vince. Steve, um, the, the, Joe's already mentioned a bit about cyber um, security ratings and how they apply it. But can you explain and give some examples how they could align to uh, the NIST cybersecurity um, framework yeah. and also the supply chain risk management issues? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so cyber, uh, in, in terms of um, monitoring uh, a vendor, Cyber is definitely a key thing, and uh, within the CSF, there's there is a category and a function which I'm sure will come up more into discussion here um, around supply chain, um, and I have it kind of notated there underneath a little black box and really small print, but it's ID.SC, and there there's several of those, and the the two that particularly map are the one uh, SC2 and SC4. Uh, SC2 is more around assessment, um, assessing your suppliers and vendors, and SC4 has to do with monitoring. Um, and mm -hmm. so really mapping those things and, and monitoring uh, appropriately uh, what, what makes sense for your organization, and certainly cyber is, is going to be one of those things. And that's where uh, looking at those external footprints, maybe validating, as, as um, you know, was previously mentioned, validating those things on the inside out where a vendor may respond with a questionnaire, but uh, using a external um, validation and seeing what do they actually look like on the outside. Oh, brilliant. Thanks very much for that. I personally think those tips are really quite valuable for people um, who are either getting into space or looking to mature their programs to the next level. Um, I, 
I think they're an excellent starting point for this afternoon's conversation. Uh, we're, we're now going to uh, move on to uh, broaden out the discussion, and we're going to leave the headshots up while we speak, as well as the uh, video camera, so you can see who's speaking. Um, I want to remind the audience this is a very much an interactive conversation. You, you are part of this conversation, um, and we've already got one question come through. So please feel free to uh, throw us your questions, and I'll, I'll feed those through to the panelists as we're going along. Um, I think for my part, I think we all recognize that um, TPRM is one of those really more challenging um, issues in any cybersecurity program with any organization. Um, but there's a lot of good guidance around, and we're going to hear some of that this afternoon from the NIST side of stuff. But really, we want to use this afternoon's conversation to really cut through to identify what's really valuable to help. Uh, align with some of the NIST cybersecurity framework and supply risk guidance because there's an awful lot of information within those documents uh, and you we all haven't got time to read it all in the level of detail perhaps they would wish we would um, so we're going to try and help you focus in on those things from those documents that are important um, I think we will start with really the real basics, which is there are threat actors out there trying to exploit our third parties. We've seen that in the press over the last 18 months. And I think we need some more real evidence um, to help convince you, some of you perhaps, and also for you to be able to convince your um, um, executives and senior management that there is an issue out there. So, Paul, can you give us some recent examples of where we've seen malicious actors taking advantage of supply chain and, and uh, damaging third-party risk equations? Yeah, I think the most recent example that comes to mind is the Black Lotus malware, which uh, took advantage of some very difficult to remediate uh, conditions in the secure boot process uh, inside of Windows systems to implant itself on the system uh, in an attempt to be more persistent and more stealthy. Uh, and, you know, remediating, Microsoft has guidance on this, but remediating these attacks uh, in, you know, from now and into the future really requires revocation of certificates that would introduce a very high degree of operational risk. We've deemed this as a forever day, if you will, because these conditions and vulnerable conditions will exist for quite some time, if not forever, because remediating them means revoking certificates that could break things. Uh, so Black Lotus is certainly uh, the most recent example of that. Brilliant. Uh, and I think the point about certificates is very valid because it affects a lot of software we get these days um, and can cause a lot of um, difficulties in trying to uh, recover from that situation. So thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, well, I, we described the wealth of the material there and someone's already complimented us on being able to provide the level of attachments we have, which will certainly... Um, um, uh, allow you to burn the midnight or reading that sort of stuff. So so let's cut to the chase. And Joe, let me ask you mm. to consider what would you consider to be the top, say, five uh, NIST controls for third-party risk that you would recommend people pay attention to? Yeah, sure. Um, I think NIST is a, an interesting framework because it takes this approach of mapping to um, different areas, uh, those areas being identify, protect, uh, detect, respond, and recover. Um, and using these, we can actually use these to assess our third party or make sure that the right considerations are in place. So firstly, from a third party, I would, expecting, I would expect them to have performed uh, a system inventory, which is a particular control within, within NIST, to identify exactly what systems they're interacting with, uh, where all of their critical assets are, what type of systems they are. Because if I get evidence of that, I know that they have a consideration of being able to protect it in the right way. So that'd be my first one, that whole identification piece. Uh, next would probably be um, the risk management strategy. So now that they've identified where these particular systems and, and, uh, and assets are within their organization, they can start to plan how they're gonna actually manage the risk associated with those systems. And again, getting evidence that they have the right control requirements in place for that strategy would demonstrate to me that they're applying the right level of due diligence to caring for, you know, potentially my data or things that might um, harm me if they were to sort of fail or perform uh, or fail in the performance or, or delivery of their service to me. So that'd be my first two, identifying where those systems are and then making sure they're applying the right risk management strategy to assess the risk. 
Only at that point would I then be comfortable that they can apply the right protection controls um, to actually manage those assets. So we'd move on to something like identification and authentication, something where I know that only the right individuals with, the, mm -hmm. with their right roles and responsibilities are able to access those controls, uh, are able to access those systems and interact with some of those, uh, those systems and potentially data in there as well. And that was a real tricky control to pick, actually, because... The protect element might vary based on the type of, of service that they're being that's been provided to me, uh, but certainly I would think if I had to pick one from that particular area, that would probably probably be it um, to demonstrate they got the right level of uh, of awareness of how to protect information. Brilliant. And there's a couple Thanks. more to run through, if I may. Just um, yeah, go on. Give us a, give us a quick couple more, then. Go yeah, on. perfect. Um, just there's two other areas. So detect. I want to make sure they've got the right um, vulnerability monitoring in place, making sure that if there's anything they've missed through their risk management strategy, they're picking up on it. And then lastly, instant handling and response plan. Obviously, if there is an incident, we want to know they can recover from it yes. because that's yeah. going to help me as one of their uh, as one of their clients. Yeah, I can't fault you on any of those. Um, five nice. selection. I, those are all ones I would pick out as well and have done for clients as well. And the only thing I would say to the audience um, about the CSF is it's in many ways, it's a much more manageable framework for senior business leaders to get their heads around. Um, I found it very, very effective in getting the message of cybersecurity across to senior leaders about what it is we're trying to achieve. They like the words of identify, protect, respond, recover, and all that. And they can get hold of the way that the controls in the framework relate to those issues in a much more meaningful way than perhaps they can when we start to talk about confidentiality, integrity, availability, blah, 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 and the rest of it. So I can really can commend the CSF, uh, and particularly from a third-party risk perspective. So thank you for that, Joe. Um, so if we're going to embrace this, this guidance, this and the other stuff, the CSF and other stuff, um, in, in some cases, of course, uh, enterprises are now being mandated to follow the NIST guidance. Um, and of course, we're doing assessments on our third parties, etc. We now have to be able to merge these two together. So, Vince, what, what are some of the best practices for leveraging the classical responses from third party during uh, NIST control assessments? How do, you, how do you start bringing all of that together? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say one of the big things in getting the data is quantif quantitative answers. And so making sure that we're taking data that can be aggregated and understood across all the vendors that are being looked at. So um, moving away from you know, some qualitative questions. And then at least with Logigate, what we can do is aggregate you know, those vendors to those controls and make sure that we're saying, you know, these answers relate to this control and this is where we're at. So kind of that automated feed of data um, to, per, to paint that picture for what those responses look like. Um, I think dashboards, reporting, anything you can do to get a clear view of, you know, this is the answer, this is where our vendors are at, and leveraging the data as you go through control assessments, as you go through risk assessments is going to be, you know, absolutely essential. Really just thinking about the bigger picture, you know, we can see what one vendor's at, but making sure we have that grasp of where all vendors are looking at, where our potential gaps are, and then being able to handle mitigations that arise as a result of that. Yeah, it's really important to to think about how you express these in numeric terms. Um, I mean, it takes a lot of effort to translate some of these controls uh, into real performance metrics. But I think there is value in doing that. And then that allows you to compare metrics across different providers, isn't it, Joe? Um, isn't it, Vince? I mean, it's, yeah. it's a challenge, but you've got to try and do it somehow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Okay, everyone. And someone's asked the question already. Um, yes, we are going to have polls, and the first poll is up there now. Uh, we find these polls as panel very, very uh, informative. They help also focus the discussion that we're having this afternoon. Um, so please, uh, we would uh, strongly uh, recommend that you answer the polls, uh, and we'll come back to the answers in a little while. This one is all about which you think is the single most important risk category or domain that you have to currently address when you're monitoring your vendors and suppliers. Uh, and while you're doing that, um, I'm going to go back to one of the tips we uh, touched on earlier. Uh, there are a number of companies, including our panelists, providing cyber security ratings and intelligence um, out there in the industry. Um, Steve, how does this figure in this guidance and, and where does this sort of supplier risk intelligence fit into NIST CSF um, and using it in supply chain risk management? 
No, great question. Uh, yeah, you know, it really does fold into the the overall due diligence that you're going to be doing or that you need to do on your supply suppliers and supply chain. Um, getting that external visibility of, of their cyber hygiene, of their digital footprint that's exposed to the internet, uh, it does a couple things. One, it can tell a story of how well they are managing their security in general, it can be an indicator but it can also validate some of those other uh, questionnaires and some of those other workflows that some of the other products that were mentioned even on, on the call today and other solutions that are out there, or if you're just sending them a, you know, an Excel questionnaire, right? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe perhaps an assertion if you, if they have a SOC 2 or something, and it really can help validate that. And then, you know, doing those types of assessments really does map across not only the CSF, but as well um, to like 853 in the SR domain. Um, and then, 800-161 has a number of good practices that um, that due diligence and uh, visibility does map to as well. Okay. The the uh, answers are coming in very rapidly. Um, I, I find, I'm in, impressed that people feel that the single most important risk category is actually cybersecurity ratings. Uh, is this what you tend to see from your own clients, that they really want those in, in a really um, – uh, constructive way to support their assessment of their vendors? Yeah, I think, it, you know, the sensitivity around cyber has really grown over the last few years. You think about all the, the different things that have happened, you know, whether it's been solar winds or Log4j or, you know, various ransomware attacks that sometimes disrupt organizations for days or weeks, uh, could shut down entire operations, shutting down healthcare. I mean, there, there's a number of significant impacts that cyber can lead to in the real world. So I think, uh, that sensitivity around cyber is definitely um, definitely a hot topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised the, the sanctions and restrictions hasn't really um, risen up the agenda from uh, our audience perspective, because I clearly know from my own experience over the last um, 18 months that uh, sanctions and restrictions issues have been a cause for concern for uh, dealing with third parties. Have you seen much activity in that space in your own work with your own clients? Uh, yeah, we are starting to see that more and more. I, I think it, there's a little more uptick in that in the financial, um, you know, fintech area uh, where there are because sanctions um, have to do with their, their typical business activities, uh, ensuring that they're not doing business with sanctioned countries is um, is definitely a, a factor in assessing the overall risk. OK, brilliant. Thanks very much indeed for that, Steve. Uh, we're now going on to our second poll. Uh, it's a very simple one. We're going to see how many people uh, in the audience are evaluating the supply chain risk of firmware in their environment uh, over the forthcoming year. Uh, and while we do that, Paul, get, while, the, while people are considering their answers, which is this very difficult and weighty question that you provided them, um, can you explain a little bit more about how we go about validating the integrity of third party firmware and software components? Sure. Yeah, I, I think I've already mentioned that we compare it to a known good um, piece of firmware uh, that we've collected and validated. Um, the other use case that I really like is, uh, as we all know, many laptop manufacturers, as an example, will end of life a particular device and not produce any more firmware updates uh, for it. I have some of these devices and I happen to really like this hardware. So what I do is using Eclipsium software in this case is I take a, a snapshot or a baseline of my device. It baselines all of the firmware that's on that device. And then I set an alert and I have uh, Eclipsium tell me if that ever changes. So I won't name manufacturers, um, but this particular manufacturer in 2020 stopped producing firmware updates for this particular laptop. If that firmware changes, that's an event that I want to be aware yeah. of because it could likely mean that an attacker has modified or tampered with the firmware on my system. Um, so that's, you, you know, we don't always don't get the latest firmware on all of our systems. We always don't refresh our laptops every single year. So I think this is a very valid strategy to monitor for lower level uh, system level code on your system. And if it changes, you can do the same thing with your bootloader uh, as an example as well. I want to know if that changes and is not a result of me updating my operating system. Yeah. And of course, the bootloader is going to be important because that's one of the things that malware is trying to target in many cases, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's that, you know, kind of in between that operating system and, and firmware handoff is uh, is your bootloader and can afford an attacker the luxury of uh, lower level code execution that bypasses protections. Yeah. And I think the other point I'd say from your comments um, about this importance of baseline, it's not unique to hardware and firmware you're talking about. I think all of the other panelists would agree that um, baselining your controls in order to understand where you are going from and to, particularly as um, Vince was mentioning in terms of metrics, it's the only way you can actually establish whether you're going from good to bad or bad to good. Mm -hmm. um, and this importance of baselining, I think, is some of those things, one of the things that we often uh, miss in a, many of our third-party risk assessments um, to try and understand where we're going from into the future. Um, so thank you for that, Paul. Uh, and what's your observations um, on, on the response to the poll? Uh, I mean, it's uh, hardly surprising, but it's it's uh, <laughs> relatively um, equal, shall we say. Um, yeah. But I, I'd, I'd welcome your views. I mean, are you getting much traction from the wider community about the importance of... Uh, uh, assessing the supply chain risk of firmware. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, events, uh, some recent, some older, that are really highlighting the importance of paying attention to your supply chain as we look at nation state attacks. The you know, current state of the world uh, is facilitating the, I think, scrutinized uh, level of trust that we have with our hardware. Where is it coming from? Where is it, is that really a Cisco device that I got or is that some kind of counterfeit uh, that is backdoored? So I think some of that is is fueling the uh, increased scrutiny we have in our supply chains. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Lee, for that, Paul. And I'll just um, say finally uh, that uh, actually rogue hardware in any devices is, is not you. Um, there was a case going back 20 years ago where there was rogue um, boards, never mind firmware, but boards with rogue firmware in mainstream routers from a major manufacturer of routers that got into a number of critical defense industry supply chains. Um, so it's not a unique problem, uh, but it's something we need to give more attention to in the future. So thanks for that, Paul. Uh, we're now going on to our third poll of the day. Uh, it's a little bit more heavy lifting for you guys uh, in this one. We're asking you to make some uh, judgments about what your view on using managed services is to do some of the heavy lifting of um, your third party risk programs. Um, and while you're doing that, um, I, I think we reckon, need to recognize that in an ideal world, our third parties would apply all NIST controls everywhere uh, by default, but we know this isn't going to be the case. Um, but we need to assess them as if they were doing so. So we need to understand what tools we need to do so. Um, so, Joe, what sort of type of tools can be used to assess and monitor a, a supplier's adherence to a NIST framework control? Um, and what does a good tool bag look like? You know, if you're going to sort of recommend a tool bag for people to use, what, what would it be? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, good, good question. Um, of course, I think we need to, if, we, if we're assessing a supplier, make sure we're leveraging, you know, an up-to-date version of NIST that features the controls that are suitable for a supplier. Um, there's obviously a vast number of controls available within NIST. I think a good starting point would be to work out which of those controls are meaningful to you. Um, so that when you start to assess your suppliers using you know, hopefully a, a platform or some form of um, efficient process of, of gaining those responses, you're able to very clearly see which of those control requirements have been met versus which of them haven't. Of course, another valuable piece of that puzzle is when you start to get these responses back for your NIST assessment, um, you're going to need to have your expertise internally to be able to manage those results as well. So having some background on NIST, making sure you're aware of the control requirements of NIST, and making sure you've set out what your expectations are for these types of responses is going to be hugely valuable. Okay. Um, some of the answers are coming in now. Um, uh, what's your take on the um, um, views of where the heavy lifting might apply? Yeah, I'm just checking this out now. So it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of the heavy lifting is really comes down to volume and, um, and resource internally. Obviously, when we have uh, a program and we're scaling up, there might be a need to assess more frequently as we discover more and more third parties that are critical to us. Uh, we might discover that there are areas or domains that we didn't have the, the capabilities to, to manage those types of um, 
uh, of control requirements ourselves. So that one might be a good position to start leveraging a managed service or even working collaboratively with a managed service to support you in your activities so that when there are areas where you do need additional assistance or additional sort of volume of resource, that type of resource is available to you. Okay, okay. And one of the one of the issues, uh, one of the questions raised by the audience, someone in the audience here, which perhaps you might have a view on, is, is what's the take up of these third parties doing and supporting programs? I mean, do you have a feel for the percentage of uh, companies who might be using this sort of um, approach using third parties? Of using the NIST approach, sorry? No, using third parties. To, sorry, using uh, providers and vendors to provide support in in answering the questionnaires and supporting your programs as a as a tool resource for you. Yeah, I, I think I think that could be valid. I would say one of the one of the concerns or one of the considerations here is that if we're leveraging those types of pools of data, we need to make sure they're up to date. So it's not sort of a once and done type process. We need to stay in tune with that type of data pool so that as we're leveraging information to pass to our clients or other organizations, uh, that information is, is, it's got its integrity till, still and it's accurate. Okay, all right. Thanks very much, Lee, for that. Uh, we're now gonna go on to our um, uh, next poll, our final poll. Uh, and this is uh, um, one where we want to really help understand um, how often you require your third parties to fill out a security questionnaire. Um, is it once? Is it uh, regularly? Is it annually? Is it when things change? Um, so while you're filling that one out, let's let's go back and examine the whole issue of uh, security uh, and information security questionnaires that you provide your clients. Um, because we all know that, and as Joe mentioned, they are very burdensome on your third parties. So um, Vince, from your perspective, how do you recommend balancing the whole issue of third party risk management and, and uh, over what it comes to potentially overloading your third parties with questionnaires to fill out? Where, where do you think the balance lies in that space? Yeah, absolutely. And I saw some questions coming in the chat to that degree too. And I think the thing to remember is, you know, you're not the only one sending out these questionnaires to everyone. <laughs> um, you know, there's a level of scale to all of that. But I think one of the most important things is risk rating uh, your vendors as they come on, determining criticality, you know, contract value, you know, uh, information, what they're going to have access to, and coming up with that initial tiering and determining what your organization's tolerance is for, all right, these are going to be annual, these can be every two years to keep them happy. Um, so I think that's a really strong way to instantly spread out that load in terms of what's going to be necessary. Um, I think another factor there too is we've seen some customers come through with short form questionnaires and long form. So maybe at onboarding, it's a lot longer of a security questionnaire. And then, you know, assuming there's no change, we're just asking a couple updated questions, say, is this still true? Check, check, check. And communicating that it's only going to take a few seconds. Um, I will say too, from the logic side, it's nice. Um, which the form automatically gives them the questions. They fill it out. It goes back to the team and so there's no email back and forth in terms of collecting those answers and dealing with that um, also really gives a strong way to manage you know what's out what needs to be followed up on and who's not filling out their survey base but yeah, yeah. I, I mean i'm finding it very reassuring that people like yourselves <laughs> who are in, in this business space as the party risk management um, well, and working for clients who are running these programs and making it clear that there is a level of burden on your um, yeah. suppliers and third parties to do it. I mean, I, I've worked with my, my own clients who have the same issue out there. And um, some of these questionnaires really do warrant a lot more um, thought before they go out. They also warrant a lot more um, context to the services and organization who the, you're sending that questionnaire to. Um, and, and I find that at times it's sometimes it's a little bit lacking. It's just a very much of scattergun approach. So I would strongly commend focusing in on those key questions and doing a risk assessment first. So I absolutely agree yeah. with you there. You have the best um, two questions in the world, but if they don't answer them, <laughs> not gonna oh, happen. exactly. Absolutely. And we want to, we want to tell them how good we are, but you know, it's lost in the details somewhere. So, so the answers are in. Um, what's your take on it? Is this what you see from your own clients that uh, doing annually seems to be the uh, most prevalent way of doing it? Uh, some people only do it once at onboarding, which I think is a bit of a concern. But what's your take on the response from the audience? Yeah, I'd say annually is definitely our uh, most common tier 
um, that people feel comfortable with. Um, sometimes that annual check-in is just, has anything changed since your last questionnaire? You know, confirm your answers and continue just to make that annual process smoother for some of those, you know, nothing's changed, don't make them go through it again. Um, I would definitely say, you know, even if it's easier to go once at onboarding, you want to have at least some way to maintain that. So I would say, you know, at least monitoring for changes, you know, keeping aware of if there's anything internally that's changed, um, monitoring the news to determine when ad hoc, ad hoc questionnaires need to go out. I, I think yeah. also what I would say is actually sending monitoring how the services are provided internally because, you know, as a third party risk program, you may not be aware of, of additional services that people are consuming through that vendor um, and therefore keeping contact with your own internal users of that service is going to be important as well, because if things change, you need to assess it again, potentially, don't you? Absolutely. And especially if you could have vendors with multiple products that need different assessments and making sure that those business units are talking um, and that you're aware of, you know, the full scope of what that vendor is doing for your company. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. For that, Vince. Um, we, we did mention that actually the burden is both on the clients who are answering this question as also teams. We know that teams are actually running big programs these days. Uh, and I think the question really becomes, how do we make it easier? So, Steve, from your perspective, we, we you know, third party risk teams are stretched thin. Then they're very under resourced in many organizations. So how can the practitioners better utilize cyber risk intelligence uh, to build and align the programs with these with the with supply chain risk management guidance that's coming from NIST? Oh, great question, Colin. And I know as a former practitioner, I, I struggled with this uh, with my team as well. Uh, you know, a, a lot of work in that always felt like not enough resources and, you know, the business wanted to move at light speed. And, um, you, you know, leveraging cybersecurity ratings can really help uh, because you can really get uh, a few things done, maybe a little quicker. And, you know, you, you can prioritize your assessments, as it was mentioned earlier, about inherently risk tiering your vendors. If you can identify at least your critical vendors and then kind of go from there, uh, you know, maybe for just getting started and and utilizing those security ratings to to determine where where are the problems, where are the issues? Uh, are there issues that we need to follow up with or can we just, hey, this is good enough and we'll, and we'll let it go? Um, and that would be, you know, think about more the, the onboarding process there, but then even from a monitoring and learning perspective, same thing, you can identify those critical vendors, set up some alerting and monitoring and, and utilize those, those indicators uh, of concern uh, to, to follow up, uh, which might even be a, like a breach event or, you know, some other critical issue. And then, you know, and then it, just in terms of moving at the speed of the business, uh, you know, maybe thinking about like rapid assessments, like is I think it was noted just just a few minutes ago, you know, is a questionnaire always needed um, if you have a lower tier vendor or maybe a vendor that's just doing a, a quick reassessment or recheck is uh, can cybersecurity ratings kind of stand on their own for that for that particular assessment. Um, and then maybe just um, mapping those and um, in in understanding how they how that plugs into the CSF overall. And again, as well as uh, I mentioned 800-161 earlier, and I think there was a question in the in the chat about that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, CSF is, is great. It's 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 um it kind of sets it overall framework. But 161 actually del delves deeper and allows you to kind of map that out um, in terms of how to build out your program, what to do, and um, it's it's a gold mine in terms of uh, how to practically implement some of these things we're talking about. One of the ways that one might be able to reduce the level of effort that our teams need to go on is accepting and viewing things like SOC 2 audit reports um, and the whole raft of other certification reports you get ranging from PCI to HIPAA to, to um, uh, ISO 27001 reports. So what's your views on, on whether people should be using those in your teams as, as a resource to help mitigate risks and accelerate the process. Um, and are there any best practices you would offer in reviewing those sorts of reports? Yeah, certainly. And, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, be, former practitioner experience wise, uh, you, you know, we we looked at things like where can can we accept a, an ISO or a SOC 2 or a, some other third party assertion in lieu of a questionnaire perhaps, or maybe scale down the questionnaire greatly and do some really focused, um, you know, five or 10 questions based on the scope of the service versus a, you know, two or 300, you know, SIG or a NIST questionnaire or something along that line. And, and I think that's where you can really optimize your program and kind of leverage the tools you have at hand and 
maybe combine that with a, you know an overlay of the security ratings because that that's going to corroborate some of those findings whether it's a questionnaire a short questionnaire or maybe a, a third party assertion uh, the third party um, you know the third party security ratings will tell the story and corroborate what you're seeing or what you're uh, the response you received. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There is some value in these things, but you do need to be able to be confident enough and uh, questioning enough to actually investigate specific issues of those reports um, to understand what, what value they offer in, in that space. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Steve. Yeah. We may come back to that later. It relates to another question that someone's asked. Um, well, one of the challenges of all third-party risk management programs is, it, is I think that um, we need to recognize there are other people involved. We already mentioned that some of the users are involved because they may change the services earlier on. And certainly when it comes to the technology side of the program, um, you know, the people running our systems, people who are building systems or implementing and putting boxes into racks and so on, also need to be concerned about what's happening from third-party risk, particularly in respect of the firmware and software. So, you know, from my perspective, Paul, um, so what are the challenges associated with knowing when third-party firmware and software component requires an update, particularly from the perspective of, you know, the implementers, the actual people doing the technology, not the people running the third-party risk program. How do they know what to do and when? Yeah, I mean, ideally you get ahead of the problem and that's some of the things that, uh, you know, we're working on collectively with the industry is knowing what puts you in a better position from a supply chain uh, in security and risk perspective. Um, it's interesting if we look at uh, some of the worst cases of this problem, you know, my friend who happened to uh, have a vulnerable TPM, right, that little lockbox on your computer that you, you put keys in uh, as a very high level overview. He happens to lead a team that found a vulnerability in a TPM and found that vulnerability on his laptop from a major manufacturer and went to the TPM vendor and they said, no, we're not vulnerable. And he said, no, you, you are vulnerable because I tested it on this laptop and it's vulnerable. And now you have to go back to the OEM manufacturer, who I won't name in this particular case, and say, hey, can you pressure your TPM vendor to issue you a patch so that I can patch my TPM? Otherwise, I'm vulnerable and my TPM doesn't have integrity, which as we move to Windows 11 becomes even more important. Um, so knowing about that situation is certainly helpful, but getting ahead of that problem and going, I don't want that model because it has an outdated TPM, I think is where we need to move to. Yeah, okay. It's interesting in relationship, there's a question someone's raised and basically is asking about uh, or recognizing that keeping basic software and firmware up to date is a challenge, which you quite clearly mentioned and, and the importance of doing so. And they mentioned in a lean organization, this becomes very difficult to justify, particularly when you added managing service, managed services on top of it and other functions. Uh, and do you have any advice or guidance for how people convince the importance of doing this and or better ways of doing it in lean organizations? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, getting the resources by uh, explaining the impact. The impact is much greater in your risk equation. An attacker that gets on your system is bad, but worse if they're able to persist deeper into the system, that gives them more stealth and more impact, which means in a ransomware attack, they can wipe out every single one of your systems in horrific ways because they have that level of uh, persistence and privilege on your system uh, to cause that level of impact. Um, and so, you know, that that I think is a, a good story uh, to tell uh, along those lines. And we also see attackers persisting to that level because operating system and EDR and other protections are getting better, kind of forcing the hand of attackers to persist down to these lower levels uh, in order to, you know, accomplish their goals. Yeah, okay. I, I think the issue about persistence is a critical point there. Um, I, I think that's one thing that we really need to get across to people about the fact that the tax against hardware, you know, they don't, you can't get rid of them easy. So keeping it updated right. and preventing them in the first place is really very important. So thank you very much, Lee, for that, Paul. That's a very valuable uh, observation. Okay. Um, in the end, we really cannot guarantee that the third party is going to tick all the boxes. Um, that's certainly come across from some of the questions in the audience this afternoon. So thank you for that, everyone. So we might need to also provide more and uh, additional reassurances. So, Joe, let me ask yourself, um, how do you go about recommending remediations or compensating controls for areas where the supplier comes up short? Uh, and if you do so, what evidence should you ask for? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there's um, 
some valuable um, approaches we can we can take in actually preparing for these situations. So when we're issuing out a questionnaire or a form of assessment against a particular standard, um, it's quite likely we're given the information on what the control requirements are for these standards. So we can actually look at those and start to almost apply an if this, then that type mechanism to how we're going to remediate based on what type of responses we're going to get back. You know, if an organisation says they don't have an information security policy in place, for example, we should perform an exercise where we know in that scenario, what are we going to say to the vendor? Um, what's the time scale to have that implemented by? Um, and what are the specifics around what would satisfy our requirements in those particular scenarios? So using that approach, it really helps us prepare for the scenarios where we do get this level of you know, risks that we then need to look into or research and really gain some inefficiencies there. Um, another quick point as well is there might not be a, a one sort of size shoe fits all in this scenario as well. Um, based on the conversations we've been having about profiling and tiering as well, the level of acceptance or what we are happy with from a vendor might change slightly based on who a vendor is and what type of service we're consuming. So we can also bake that into some of these approaches and some of these preparations as well. You know, if, it, if a supplier interacts with um, sensitive data on our behalf, for example, then maybe we have a different level of tolerance for those types of risks relating to data security. And those are all things that we can prep for in advance. Okay. Okay. I mean, this relates to a question someone's asked um, from the audience, or observation. I apologise. Uh, observation, uh, where they say it's finding very, they find it very difficult convincing cyber vendors to agree to the company's uh, cyber security requirements. And um, one of the greatest, it's one of their greatest challenges. I mean, do you think that there should be mandatory compliance with all the requirements, or is this where do you think compensating controls come in, where you have as a balance between what's wanted and what is provided? Yeah, and I think this comes down to that preparation, really. I mean, we're that process of remediation should be something that is constantly evolving as we learn more about our suppliers and we see different types of responses. You know, we discussed a second ago about um, potentially being provided with a SOC2 report or a, a different certification in lieu of a survey, for example. Um, so if we use those and learn from those lessons as we start to see these types of different responses come through, then we can always remain agile and know how to behave in the future when we get a similar, similar scenario come up. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Joe. Um, perhaps the worst case um, would be remediation from a third party, but also the workload on our own team, when, particularly when it fails to meet the remediation requirements. Um, so, Vince, how, how do you prevent assessments from falling through the cats? You know, particularly if you've got a lot of them uh, and you're balancing a high volume of vendors and some of them have got remediation programs that are important. So how, how do you strike this balance to avoid this uh, falling between the cracks? Ooh. Let's go off mute. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think this is one of the areas where it's, you know, getting out of Excel is one of the big ones where it's tough to have, you know, just tracking different due dates and different remediation plans and all of the action items in there. Um, Having that centralized view into when things are expected from vendors, when cadences are coming up, um, ownership of you know what that reporting looks like in terms of where things need to be, uh, timelines on these remediation plans for vendors, actions that are being taken in the interim. I think making sure that you have a robust data stream coming in and then a way to handle that and quickly get a view into that is going to be a way that you're not missing due dates. You don't have to scroll through a 300 page doc or 300 row Excel document, filter it continue to search that and kind of take the manual process out of it is going to empower your program. Just keep track of those dates, make sure your vendors are accountable for hitting them. And, you know, your team has a grasp on where you currently are at that point in time. I think having a, an appropriate workflow also helps, doesn't it? And that's where some of the tools out there really um, provide focus on what's due next and when and why, isn't it? So, you know, perhaps investing in those tools, if you're perhaps overburdened and manage them appropriately, is perhaps the right answer? Yeah. Or am I absolutely. overselling it? No, absolutely. Um, like Logic for example, fantastic for that. But really any of these tools that is going to move you out of Excel, take you to the point where you can see what am I responsible for right now? What are my vendors responsible for? And when should I expect to have this answer back? Having that workflow established is massive. Yeah, yeah.
Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, I think the minimum level of assurance we want to achieve through any of this, particularly um, in respect to CSF, uh, this CFF, is what we might call cybersecurity hygiene. Although I think we would recognise that cybersecurity hygiene uh, is uh, an emotive topic because it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but in principle, in principle, Steve, how do cybersecurity ratings provide a legitimate assessment? of someone's um, a supplier's cybersecurity hygiene? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And, um, you know, th there's there technically there could be arguments both ways. But really, you know, if you think about it, it really does. Like I said earlier, it does tell a story. All right. It's not the whole story, but it does tell a story. It's an indicator. And if we have a vendor or, or any company that does not manage their their Internet facing systems well, um, where there's maybe a lot of findings and they don't have a good security rating, you know, what does that tell you about how they might handle their, their internal infrastructure? And um, it's not necessarily always a one-to-one -one matching, but it definitely does tell a story. And it can be uh, helpful to validate, again, some of those questionnaires or um, assertions. If they say they, they patch and they say they, they do all these great things, but yet you're seeing end-of-life software detected on their outside um, yeah you know, attack, attacker facing, uh, you know, attack surface, then is that something that, you know, is reasonable or not? And is that something that's worth following up? And then, um, you know, the, the other thing that I'll mention here is that there's been a fair number, uh, amount of research that's been done in the last few years correlating um, significant ransomware events and breaches with lower cyber, hy lower cyber hygiene. So companies that typically don't manage their their external digital footprint well do become more susceptible to things like ransomware attacks uh, mm -hmm. or, or breach events. So um, it's definitely an indicator and can definitely be very helpful as you fold that into your overall program. I suppose one of the things you have to do when you look at the breach side of things is really understand what led to that breach in the first place and how that relates to cybersecurity hygiene, don't you? Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges is that we can get a bit obsessed about breaches at the time, particularly when some of those breaches, shall we say, exceed uh, the attack potential of the of the um, strategy of trying to breach you is better, stronger than what you could reasonably expect someone to defend against, uh, if you're with me. Um, so yep, thank you for that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, uh, we're going to go to some of the more of the audience questions um, now. I'm going to turn to yourself, Paul. Um, this goes back to the issue of lifespan and devices. Uh, someone's asked the question of that, is there being pressure of being applied to vendors for keeping systems patched longer in the lifespan? You know, three-year-old laptop may be a higher security risk for your supplier um, if he stops remediating that risk. Are you seeing any pressure to, shall we say, replace older devices or, or is there um, some sort of middle ground out there? I think, uh, Colin, you're right. It is, it is middle ground because while we do want to push uh, OEMs and manufacturers to increase the support lifespan of devices, it, it's not economically feasible in, in a lot of cases. So, I, you know, I do have some sympathy on, on that end as well. Where I do see the conversation going lately is turning to open source for an extended period of support. So using open source firmware. Uh, to extend the life of your device and the open source projects tend to provide a little bit longer support uh, and support some of these legacy devices uh, for a longer period of time, but that also ends. You know, Core Boot is an open source UEFI implementation as an example. So I, I do see folks both pushing on the open source side and pushing on the, the OEM side. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve, for that. Um, uh, Joe, I want to turn to you for one. You mentioned the importance when you were mapping out the CSF controls, which are important. You, mm -hmm. know, you talked about identification. Um, and someone's asked a really good question here about basically saying, you know, accurate identification of data and data flows and attributes, mm -hmm. et cetera, is, you know, it's critical to effective assessment. So if you don't understand what the data flows are and what the assets are, then uh, an attributes of that data, you've got a problem. One of the problems they recognize, though, however, is it's not just you as the third party risk management would know. It's basically all those people inside the organization who are consuming that third party service who are party to that information flow where you may need to get some of that information from, yeah? The users internally of that service. So how do you go about convincing them that they've got to contribute to doing the assessment or providing better understanding of what they're using it for? Yeah, I think it's a, a mutually beneficial relationship when we start to look at data flows. 
Um, it's going to be something that um, is definitely more common now, especially since we saw GDPR, um, where we have to provide that uh, that assurance that data flows and uh, systems that, that actually house some of that data is um, uh, is being looked after. So I would say it's definitely more of a collaborative approach. I wouldn't say we have to get full visibility of exactly what those systems are, but this is more a, um, a collaborative approach of knowing that the right controls or the right risk management structure is taking place to protect them. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, Vince, uh, there's there's some really interesting questions here about um, uh, how you how do you validate that what the third party supplier has entered into the form or questionnaire is accurate? Um, I mean, people are hoping for some sort of database that they can correlate or bump the compare the answers to. I mean, have you got any sort of sense where you can provide some help to people to try and uh, interpret the answers they're given? Yeah, I mean, it's always going to be a challenge is, you know, trusting that data in um, is going to be quality. I think, you know, relying on some reports, certifications, asking for SOC 2 reports, asking for any additional outside things are going to be valuable. But yeah, it's always going to be a challenge to make sure you're trusting that data. Um, I know compensating controls were brought up recently, but I think that's a good way to get a little more assurance too, where, um, you know, as your internal controls are robust, you're going to have a little more leeway to potentially untrue vendors um, providing that information. So, yeah, just... Uh, it's difficult, isn't it? It's very, I mean, it's it's very difficult, and, you know, it's one of those ones where, um, you know, getting vetting into those relationships and making sure you're going into a partnership with a company where you feel confident uh, in both their profile, their posturing and their position in the market, yeah. Yeah, from my sense, I think the point you're making there is absolutely is the best way of resolving this issue is if you can have a trustworthy relationship with the third party and it's not adversarial you're more likely and be going to be more confident you're going to get answers that are valid yeah, and accurate totally. um, and particularly if you're not super critical of some what some things they're doing and can understand where they're coming from and this of course comes to what joe was talking about compensating controls and understanding where that balance lies and that's a mutual dialogue because you both have skin in the game they have skin in the game providing you services and you have skin in the game because of what they're doing. So it's it's a it's a two way shop, isn't it, Vince? Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, um, Steve. Um, there's there's a, there's a great question here about um, how fair is it to ask to mandate third party vendors to agree to terms to audit or a surprise audit from you? I mean, do, do you do you have a problem with um, uh, conducting actual audits on um, providers? Uh, you know, from a from a cybersecurity ratings perspective, those typically are um, not they, they typically don't require permission. The, the things that, at least from the you know on the risk recon side, it's all publicly available information. And but but presenting that information to the the vendor may be a surprise, right? Of hey, we found this this bad thing on your on your network, and we want you to do something about it. And and I think where um, and there was there was a similar question in there about you know, getting a vendors to agree to uh, you know your security initiatives and and I think you know ensuring that there's things in the contract language which the NIST CSF and uh, 800-161 do cover uh, do, they do mention that uh, making sure that you have appropriate controls and you have agreements uh, or or no, uh, elements in your agreements with your suppliers for you know basic security protocols which might include responding to issues that you find or, or breach events. Um, and, and that would take some of the surprise out of it because it, mm -hmm. you're, you're predetermining ahead of time that, um, you know, here, here's the game plan. Here's how we're going to treat these issues when they come up. Yeah. And of course, uh, for those people who are dealing with European companies and European issues under the general data protection regulations, if you are processing personal information, um, service providers, or you're supposed to have a, the right to audit expressed in the contract of your service mm -hmm. providers. So in some environments, you know, it's not a question of when or if, it's must. Um, and you've got to put it into the contract accordingly. So that's becoming increasingly important. Uh, we've got a couple, more, a couple more minutes before we go into the takeaways. Uh, and I'm just going to grab my panelists uh, just for a one line or a couple of words about their thoughts on fourth party risks. Um, because someone's asked the question about how far down the food chain, the supply chain, you can go. So I just uh, welcome your quick views on that. And I'll start with yourself, Paul. Um, what's your view on going down to the um, nth party degrees? 
Yeah, I mean, that can be uh, really tricky, <laughs> especially when we talk about, uh, you know, the hardware and firmware supply chain, as many of these components uh, can go to fifth, sixth, you know, and above yeah. level components. Um, and I think the uh, solution that we are collectively working towards is to use SBOMs as part of that validation as it traverses down uh, the supply chain and validating those SBOMs. So if everyone is creating one as it comes down, we can also generate our own yeah. and we can do that comparison. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Jade. And a quick answer from yourself, um, Joe. What do you, what's your view on the fourth party risk? Yeah, I think it's um, essential to work out exactly whether that fourth party is supplying a critical service to our third, third party um, and making sure that that due diligence of a, a sufficient supplier management process is trickling down the line. Um, I think that resource is always going to be a constraint when it comes to going, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh uh, party yeah. down the line. Um, but if we can tier our third parties and make sure that we are approaching uh, and addressing as far down the chain as we can for those really critical suppliers, then that should be, you know, a reasonable um, level Brilliant. to achieve. Thanks very much, Steve, uh, Vince. Uh, uh, Joe, Vince, your view. Sorry, I was going to you next, Vince. Your yeah, quick no. answer. <laughs> yeah, I think including some questions within the questionnaire. I know Siglite has a few great ones on this, but just confirming their posturing on those fourth parties, asking if there's documented risk management policies, asking what data those at the parties have access to, and just getting some assurances from them that they are also doing this diligence down the line to feel more comfortable as that Brilliant. goes. Thank you very much, Steve Vince. And we're going to go to our takeaways now, and I'll give um, Steve the opportunity to go first with his takeaway for this afternoon's conversation. Um, so, um, um, Steve, over to you. And if you want to say anything about fourth party, feel free to do so at this stage. Yeah, sure. Like uh, fourth party, I would just say visibility is important because you can end up with concentration risk where you have a common vendor out there supplying your 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 third parties, and you can have a cascade supply chain event, which you want to try to avoid. So, just at least minimal visibility. Um, is important there. Um, and then in terms of the, you know, the key takeaways uh, is really, you know, doing, uh, making sure you're doing business with vendors that do have good cyber hygiene or takes uh, cyber hygiene seriously, that can be an indicator. And, and just be aware that, you know, we, there is, there's data out there, research out there that does align things where cyber hygiene is not so good. Uh, we have uh, greater propensity for for uh, breach risk as well as ransomware events, and um, and on the on the slide there, there's more more information if you want to know more on our particular platform. Um, Brilliant, thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Um, Vince, your takeaway, sir. Yeah, absolutely. So, just again, I think all the information today has been really important. I would say we've got some great white papers on our website for anybody looking to learn more about um, how Logigate handles this than that but again like i said at the beginning crawl walk run to build out your program and you know that's going to help a lot um feel free to connect with me i've got my information here if anybody wants to learn more about logigate platform anything there um be happy to chat thank you very much Steve vince um over to you joe your takeaway for this afternoon's conversation yeah i would say uh take a step back from your third party risk management program and actually assess the level of maturity across each of the sort of pillars that, that stand up a good program. You know, it's very easy to get carried away in reacting to new suppliers and, and the scale of what the problem is. Um, but there should be some uh, at least quarterly checkpoints where you actually reassess, reassign, uh, realign objectives um, and really plan to increase maturity rather than just tackling problems. Fine. Thank you very much, Nijo. Uh, and your last word, Paul. Yeah, so uh, check out some of the information we have there specific to uh, some of the NIST uh, standards and uh, guidelines that specifically call out firmware and uh, supply chain security. Uh, we recently just launched a brand new website, so it's a good opportunity to check it out. Uh, it's a great way to contact us uh, and read some of the recent articles on our blog where I, I do regular uh, writing. And uh, we will be uh, announcing some more supply chain related uh, features coming up at the RSA conference as we focus more on uh, solving those supply chain issues for our clients. Thank you very much, Nepal. And can I just say a very quick thank you to all my panelists. It's been a really engaging conversation and thanks for your contribution. And thank you to the audience for your contribution with the excellent questions you've been throwing at us this afternoon. So with that, thank you, everyone. And I'll hand you back to Kelly. Kelly, close us out, my dear. 
Thank you, Colin. And uh, thank you, panelists, for a great discussion. I know our audience appreciates all of the good information they got today. Uh, listeners, for those of you who qualify for CPE credit, your certificates will be issued within seven days from our learning management system at itcpeacademy.org. So please watch out for the email notification on that and check your spam if you don't see that come through. Join us again next month for data access governance in the digital age. You can reserve your seat now through the console, but before you do that, please do take a moment to leave us a rating and feedback for the session. We value feedback and it helps us plan for future events. So that's it for today. I'd like to thank our speakers for your participation with a special thanks to our sponsors, LogicGate, Eclipsium, Prevalent, and Risk Recon. Without them, this event would not be possible. And of course, thank you once again for listening. Please stay tuned for our next event and have a great day, everyone.